Hi everyone, welcome to the latest episode of the EFL Magazine podcast. Today's guest is Laura Wilkes. Laura is a video and podcast producer who helps educators record content to grow their community. Before becoming a producer and setting up Communicating for Impact, Laura taught English, trained teachers and led academic teams across the world for 15 years. Laura is also the producer of the Tessel Pop podcast, which provides bite-sized episodes on teaching, trends, and careers for educators. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Hey, everyone. Buckle up for a new episode of the EFL Magazine Business Podcast, the one and only podcast made to help you launch your business or take your existing business to a level of success you could never have imagined. Whether you're a school owner, freelancer, publisher, or other entrepreneur, you're sure to pick up lots of actionable advice when you listen to the EFL Magazine Business Podcast. Remember to visit eflmagazine.com for great articles and features. Without further ado, here's your host, the founder of EFL Magazine, Philip Pound. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the latest episode of the EFL Magazine podcast. And today I'm delighted to have from Communicating for Impact, um, a podcast and video producer. And it's Laura Wilkes. Laura, how are you today? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for inviting me to be on the show. It's a pleasure to be here. No problem. And uh, I, uh, I'm, I'm delighted to have you. And you're coming from beautiful Luzerne today. And I just looked at the tourist website uh, by its own reckoning, it's the most beautiful city in the world. Is, is, is that right? <laughs> you know, on a day like today, it's su- uh, sunny outside. It's absolutely gorgeous. I definitely feel like I'm in one of the most beautiful parts of the world, for sure. Mm. And how did you end up in Switzerland? Yeah, it's just one of those scenarios, you know, where you're kind of like looking for opportunities and uh, a job opportunity came up that happened to be in Switzerland, working for a company that I'd worked for before and it was the right time to leave Hong Kong which is where me and my husband were based at the time there was a lot of change that was um, going happening in in Hong Kong so we were ready for a a change of scene and so that's what what made us uh, take the opportunity that moved us with with the job offer I got in the end of 2020 so just before Brexit uh, we moved um, to Switzerland so yeah. Gotcha yeah I I, I know there's been a lot of uh to say the least changes let's we will uh, a euphemism mm-hmm. there uh for um for hong kong but uh there's been quite a flight from hong kong hasn't there of uh yeah, yeah. what what do you know numbers or have like anecdotally like your friends leaving or yeah definitely friends of uh are leaving um and it is quite a, a i would say it goes with the city anyway a lot of people do come and go it is that kind of transient city but for me what I've seen in terms of the trends there does seem a lot more people moving on um than what would normally be uh the case I, I can't remember the numbers from the top of my head but there have been quite a lot of educators um leave and move uh, to other places and for my husband who works in broadcasting there's obviously a concern about you know broadcasters working in that environment what you can and cannot say given the national security law and how um difficult that can be sometimes to navigate and to interpret to ensure that you are following um, what is uh, agreed within the guidelines uh, that could be quite a, an added stress for people working in that kind of industry. So that's what kind of made us think, well, maybe now's the time to kind of try somewhere new. Gotcha. Okay. Well, we won't have any such strictures here today on the, on the podcast. Yeah, we speak were, freely. <laughs> free, speak freely, speak your mind. <laughs> Freedom of uh, expression. So I just wanted to start out and I'm, I'm really delighted to have you on. Uh, well, because I, I I've seen some of your stuff on on LinkedIn uh, going around, and uh, I've been doing this podcast for. I should have checked before I came on. I said this. I, I stop and and start for about maybe three years, and um, just from from my perspective, I I've just restarted the podcast, and I'd I'd been on a kind of hiatus for I, I don't know maybe a year, and. I'll have to apologize to the listeners. The first few podcasts have not been good. I've been very rusty. and uh, uh, But the question I wanted to ask, rather than blabbering on, was uh, the, the main problem a lot of people have with podcasts is they don't stick at it very long. Yeah, that is a big challenge, isn't it? But I think it is because 
you know, you start out and you have these models of comparison that are led by big media houses like the BBC, like NPR for those in the in the US, and um, that are on a weekly or even bi-weekly release schedule. So when we look to those, it kind of feels like, oh, well, maybe that's the model I have to follow to be a podcaster. Um, and that's quite a quick way to end up burning out when you're just starting out and you probably have another job, you're busy with teaching, you've got a family life and all that sort of thing. So, you know, one thing I do when I'm working with new podcasters is think about, you know, what could you commit to? A mini series is a good place to start. Okay, let's plan six episodes. You'll learn a lot from six. Uh, You'll get patterns and you'll uh, evolve over that six and it's manageable. And, you know, you can then make a decision after that series, that standalone series has been out there to decide, well, okay, do I want to do another series? And if so, when? So not locking yourself into this kind of weekly or fortnightly release schedule, which can become really difficult to sustain when you're just starting out. And you're probably just the only one creating the podcast as well. So you're responsible for the um, recording, the editing, the publishing, the promoting. That's a lot of hats to wear, isn't it? So I always encourage people to start a bit smaller so they can find what consistency and sustainability means for them and to not you know, have to compare themselves. Comparison is a terrible thing, isn't it, when it comes to creativity and growth, but to find what really works for them and to lean into that. Yeah, teeth of joy, isn't it, the comparison? It really is. Yeah. But, yeah, that that's, uh, I mean, where were you all those years ago when when I started out? And, uh, yeah, it's right. <laughs> for for a lot of podcasts, the difficulty is you have to put it together. And I don't really like editing so much. I know you're an editor. We'll talk about that a little bit. Um, uh, I, I I like doing the podcast, releasing it, and it, it's a lot of work, you know, and it, some people want transcripts, get that done, and getting links done, and sharing it, and uh, um, so it does take up a little bit of time, but yeah, something something more manageable, something, yeah, yeah, yeah that you can, you can put into play. I think, you know, a podcast, and with business in general, uh, it, it uh, I think it's a little bit like uh, if you've ever seen Hillary and Jackie, that movie about Jacqueline Dupre, the the cellist, and uh, she she's she's a uh, yeah, devoted cellist, but she leaves the the cello out on her balcony when it's snowing. You know, it, I, I think we sometimes have that with podcasts, isn't it? We, it's a love hate thing. I think it can be, particularly if you end up like maybe taking on a bit too much and not giving you space to have time away from podcasts. I I have been in that situation where I've tried to scale a bit too soon with my own shows and it's just become a bit of a grind and that can really take out the fun and joy that goes into creating something that's wonderful that, you know, can reach thousands of people, you know, even more than that around the world and really uh, create those connections. I think it's really important to kind of think about, yeah, what what's manageable and, and not biting off too much and giving ourselves also time away to to kind of get that creative inspiration and to rest. And also asking for help as well, not being afraid to kind of invite other people to help us and um, to be part of the project, whether it is part of the business and you've got funding for that or even a voluntary project that you're working on. I think there's a lot of a lot to gain from from building up a small team. That's true, and for, for me, I think uh, what you've said is 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 correct, and what we're trying to do uh, and trying to do here with the podcast is get more variety in the podcast because a lot of what mm-hmm. I've I've been doing is, as, as the listeners and can probably see, is we've had guests on about landing pages and marketing and branding and these these, uh, but a lot of the interviews I've done is uh, you know, people owning businesses, and it seems I've done a lot of those interviews, and I seem to have run out of road a little bit, especially I think that the latest ones um, on Japan, because, you know, I've interviewed a lot of people with businesses here in Japan and it's, I seem to be repeating it. And then it's like, I've nothing else really to to say, you know, it's like, well, how did you come to Japan? What's the difficulties of doing business in Japan? And then I'm like, you know, a bit spent. Yeah. I wonder what your listeners suggest, though. I think this could be a wonderful way, rather than the pressure being on you, um, to think of these angles and what people need and like those areas of interest. And also, I think you do have similar conversations, right? But it's like, what's the angle that you're looking for here that could be different? I wonder what your listeners have to say in terms of like, what challenges are they facing? What questions and things that would they like to learn? Because I think they could be a huge source of inspiration for you. That's probably what I'd look to first, because, yeah, I bet they have things that they really want to ask you, but they're just not here in the room with us right now. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's uh, that's a good point. And uh, it, it's something, I, it, the point you you made in uh, 
a few moments ago was uh, we don't kind of reach out enough, do we? We don't uh, ask it's the important yeah. thing. Another it's strange, question. isn't it? Oh, yeah, go yeah, on. It is. Yeah, so, sorry. sorry, no, for, for cutting across you there. But um, another question I had, and it's in the forefront of my mind here because he was a guest on the previous uh, podcast, was uh, um, uh, Ryan Higland. And Ryan is a business owner here in Japan, very successful with a number of schools. And uh, I said that I was having a podcast expert on in a couple of weeks. And I would ask her this question because uh, he asked me and I ran out, <laughs> ran out of road again. Uh, so it was how to be a good podcast guest. Oh, that's a good question, isn't it? I've not been asked that actually for a while. Um Oh gosh, I think it's it's very much a partnership, isn't it, between the podcaster and the guest. So like if we take the example of what we've done today, and um, we spent some time just before we hit record to kind of understand like who's the listeners, what is that you want to achieve, what sort of questions we're going to be talking about today. And I asked you about the tone and style in terms of like the um how succinct my answer should be, how much, how much depth you want me to go into. So I think really partnering and understanding. Um, what the podcast vision is and who the audience is, is a key thing to think about. Um, and taking some time to think about like what, where you can provide value to that listenership, because that's ultimately going to not only boost the podcast and serve the listeners, but it also serves your brand as well in giving up your time to, to record something like this. If you're going to provide value to folk, um, that's only going to be a really positive thing for, for your business and brand. So there, there's just a few things like see it as a partnership, Think about, get to know really who the listenership is, what's the vision, what's the style, and then how can you best serve that with the uh, expertise that you bring to the conversation. And for the uh, for the podcast host, it's a bit like the uh, Bruce Lee in Enter the Dragon, as you probably know, living in Hong Kong. It's uh, like uh, you, we look at the moon, not at the finger. So the idea is to point the people in the, in the right direction, isn't it? Is to, to almost be in the background. I, I think as a host, I should be really in the background and sh and the, the guest should have the limelight i i yeah. is is that a good way of looking at it or are there different ways of approaching it i think it really depends on your style it'll be a shame if you disappeared too much into the background because i bet your listeners follow you because it's you and they really enjoy the perspective that you bring to conversations and how you enrich conversations with sharing your experience asking your your questions that come to mind that are you know fed from your experience of interviews and and your work in education as well um so i think you have to think about what it is that you bring and how you can also um create space for that i give an example of um, a podcast i listen to that's not educational i've been listening to it for well over 10 years and that's the mark maron wtf podcast Sometimes I listen to the podcast just to listen to his introduction because I'm such a fan of Mark and I love his introductions and like learning about what's happening with his cats and his comedy scene and all that sort of messiness that is his life. Sometimes I don't listen to the guest interview because the guest is just isn't relevant to me. It's not a comic or artist that I particularly um, connect with, but I will definitely stay around to listen to the introduction. So I think it's important to create space for that, to build that relationship with your listeners because you're the glue that keeps the show all together. So yeah, don't don't become too much uh, into the background. I think definitely lean into what you can bring and what your experiences bring to the conversation. Okay. And for somebody starting out as a, as a podcaster, of course, we've all been uh, over the past, how long are podcasts a thing? Are they 15 years? Are we talking? Or maybe oh, since well. the iPhone, was it 2006, wasn't it? I think. Maybe yeah, 2005, like almost, 2006, around about then. Yeah, yeah. Almost 20 years, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, it's gone by quickly. It's gone by. And uh, so good podcast to listen to for somebody who wants to be a podcaster. I'm sure everybody listens to uh, the gardening or knitting or football, whatever. But for someone for the craft of podcasting. Oh, goodness. Yeah. So I recommend um, Ashley and Kane's uh, podcast called The Podcasters Podcast. It's not easy to find when you search for it on Spotify. You're going to have to kind of lean into the, the searching for that. But it is called The Podcasters uh, Podcast. And that's brilliant in kind of breaking down the nuts and bolts from recording to the promotion to the tech. They really lean into like frequently asked questions that are relevant wherever you are on your journey, whether you're just starting out or if you're an established podcaster. So I love listening to that because that kind of 
you know, it gives me fuel for thought um, in terms of where I can continue evolving. And it it is like that, isn't it? Like with any craft podcasting, you're always trying something new or the next episode, you're going to try this, make this thing a little bit better. So I, I love that kind of space that they create for podcasters of all stages uh, through their podcast. So yeah, I would suggest that folks check that out. It's a brilliant, brilliant show and not too long either. Great. And just start at the let's start at the beginning here for somebody who wants to start out with podcasting. You know, I thought at as not so much now, but when I first started podcasting, you know, you you join all the groups, don't you, and the discussions and the 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 first one is always what what equipment should I buy? And uh, you oh, know, yeah. and they, they some people you know, they it's always the same discussion. Should I buy this one? Should I buy this audio interface? Should I buy this microphone? And Always somebody comes up and just says, buy whatever is is good enough and just start your <laughs> podcast. Is is that what you'd recommend as well? Or is there anything in particular you think uh, people should have from the outset? Well, I think most people overlook the space that you're recording. And that's probably the biggest thing that I, I don't see talked about enough is like where you're recording is really important. So I can see like where you're recording, you've got a lovely heavy set curtain that will help to absorb the sound. You're in a room that has uh, soft furnishings around you, which again helps to stop the sound from bouncing. You're in a good position to your microphone. Uh, so there's not a distance. So again, reducing the kind of reverb that's created in the room. So I think that's the first thing to kind of evaluate. Where do you have to record? Place that's quiet, that's small, that you can add furnishings to, uh, whether it's cushions, curtains, rugs, or even those um, sound absorbing panels that are becoming a much more readily available in the main market now than what they used to be. Um, this is the first step. And then there's no such thing as like, oh, this is the microphone that's that's perfect. I think there's a perfect microphone for you, but there's no such thing as like one size fits all. And this is where we see microphones that have... Um, a certain status or a certain marketing uh, campaign uh, lead the lead conversations just because they've yeah they've they've got really good marketing to go with it. So I'd say to folk who are just starting out, you don't need to spend hundreds and hundreds of pounds on a microphone. In fact, I think really consider again your space, and then maybe you have access to something that you could borrow. Or maybe you already have a microphone that would do a pretty good job as you're starting out. Otherwise, um, really kind of just test out a few different models if you can in a store. Um, but don't feel like you have to just go for the most expensive because it can then be just too powerful. And then, you you know, even if you cough or, or tap the table, it's going to pick up all the noise. And that, that can be difficult to, to kind of work with if you're working with like the very, very high end microphones. There's just a few things, I think, that are. I see in conversations on forums, um, for sure. But yeah, no, no kind of one perfect set to suit everybody, for sure. Great. And as uh, we didn't mention, of course, you are a video producer as well. So we yeah. we want to go on to uh, on to that. So um, I, I I don't know if I should uh, ask you questions because uh, you know I kind of have the. I always say the curse of knowledge here because I, I've kind of asked all these questions in the past and it, it, it just seems so long ago and there's some things I, I take for granted, but uh, I have to ground myself a little bit here. So uh, getting podcast guests, what's, how do you, how, oh, how, do, let's say, what's, how to choose a niche, a niche within a niche and then get people to, to interview and then get followers. Oh, Yeah. Okay. Um, well, if you're just starting out, I think it's good to kind of like brainstorm, like who is your target audience and then go and talk to them to actually test out your idea. So think about like very, very specifically, and I'm not just talking like um, ESL teachers, like that's too broad, like really specifically like ESL teachers uh, at a certain level of experience that are teaching this form of ESL, for example. So get really, really intentional about like where they're at in their journey and also how does your podcast serve them? Like what problem or challenge or opportunity is that person facing and how does your podcast fill that gap? So before you even record that, like just brainstorm those ideas and then go and talk to people. That's what I do on my courses. Like we don't record and then go and talk to people and put it out there you know, think about the idea and then do like just a very simple market research, which I know can sound a bit intimidating to folk, but it can be as simple as like just having a coffee with five, eight people, just short conversations saying, hey, I've got this idea for a show. What do you think? And then just listening to their feedback and letting them ask questions. And that will help you just to kind of, yeah, to polish that idea. So that would be the the first part, like kind of really finding your niche. It won't be perfect when you start out. Um, 
just just getting started, I think, going back to that mini series, putting it out there um, and then looking at the analytics and getting some feedback as you uh, go through that first mini series will help you to further lean into your niche and make confident decisions about, you know, what you talk about, the topics, the titles, the guests you pick up, um, pick up for your show if you're doing an interview format. And you asked me about um, guests as well. I think when you're playing that first mini series, just think about the topics that really help to solve that problem for that specific listener. Like what sort of questions and challenges are they facing and who's best to talk about that in terms of their area of experience and also how comfortable they are in being on a podcast. Because some people, you know, it's not their thing. If they're going to feel quite uncomfortable um, on the microphone, then, you, you know, maybe you can obviously spend more time like coaching them a little bit and and helping them prepare, of course, to make them feel comfortable, but maybe um, not choosing them for your first series, maybe choosing people who may have talked about it before in other spaces because um, you're learning as well as a podcast podcaster. So it's good to have an experienced guest with you to partner in that first series. That there's, there's just a few tips I would suggest really to get started. Have I answered your question? Cause that was like two questions in one. I know. Uh, I can't yeah. remember I, like, I, did I get that? The, yeah. And that's, that's my fault. And that's uh, perhaps something you could, uh, you could talk about as well as uh, I, I sometimes have a habit of asking two or three questions together. So <laughs> maybe not a good idea is maybe ask one single question, then maybe a follow-up question. Yeah, that'd be great. I, I was struggling to remember, like, uh, what was the second part of that question as I was answering that? But I I think I got it right. Don't ask me. I've forgotten already. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's um, that's and and actually, I, I did take your advice because I think my oh, I can't remember who my first guest was. I think it was Ian Simpson, who's uh, uh, he lives here in Japan, actually, originally from Wales. And uh, he he has what two, three podcasts, surfing podcasts. Uh, wow. He he runs a, a few schools in in Mia here in Japan. So um, I said to Ian, I'll interview you first because you're a, you're a seasoned podcaster. So yeah, so um, I did, and uh, Ian gave me some really good advice as well. And his podcasts are, are going really well. Um, Ian, if you're listening, hello. Um, I wanted to go on to uh, uh, videos and uh, specifically mm. YouTube videos. Okay, so um, I'm kind of expanding things here We're going to be producing a lot of videos over the next uh, next few months and actually i'm taking into to mind what you've said about not burning myself out as well so yeah. that's something i'm going to have to reflect on but um you know it's like researching for podcasts and looking for equipment that i started off like last few months and you get tube buddy don't you it's kind of like an seo program for uh for YouTube, isn't it? I, I know there's another one as well. I can't remember the name is has escaped me now. I, I, pro I probably have that one as well. Um, so there's TubeBuddy, which does the SEO. And then you watch all the videos about thumbnails, don't you? How to get the best thumbnail and you know, the best the best equipment, how to how to cut and paste your your video. So do an intro, you know, there's a there's a tantalizing piece, and then answer that, and then you know, leave it, leave it to the end of the the end of the video so the, and then obviously do m shorter cuts at the beginning get them engaged and you know so i've been i've been learning a lot of stuff but for one of the videos i came across which looked blurry and badly produced but had a lot of followers the person just made the point just make good con content and people will yeah will, will watch it that's the foundation for sure yeah again knowing your audience what it, their problem is and how your content serves them and respecting their time. So like conveying what they're going to get from watching your video and really delivering on that, that will, that is honestly the foundation for everything because then people will be like, you know what, Phil's videos, this is worth my time. I'm going to subscribe. Oh, he's got a new video. I'm going to watch this because I really learned a lot from that previous video. So I'm going to give you my time. And I think that's the key thing, isn't it? Really respecting our audience's time to deliver on what we say we're going to do. Yeah, exactly. And from, uh, uh, I mean, there's some of the top uh, YouTubers here. I, I, I don't, but I'm going to have to mention Mr. Beast on there. So that's yeah, everybody. Yeah, you're going to get uh, it. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, uh, well, it's it's kind of strange stuff going on. I've I've kind of lost track of what there was. Kind of some controversy going on with with him, but uh, breakdown. I I think I've done this uh, before with David Beckham actually on brand branding and why David Beckham was so you know was so good at branding and why he was so successful 
Um, so, Mr. Beast, why do people watch it? I I know it's probably teenage boys mostly that watch it, is it? Or I, I I watched a couple of the videos, but I'm like thinking, yeah, it's a bit young for me. I don't know what his actual audience is, but uh, yeah, it's probably aimed at a younger audience. But he has got quite a clear formula, hasn't he? That he's developed, and that's what's wonderful about. And when you do find your voice and what works for you and your audience, so you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. You just need to kind of lean into that formula. So if you watch his video, he starts with a very strong hook. He's usually shouting. Uh, yeah. Usually it's something like, you know, I've got 100 people here and they've got to stay in the circle. The last one standing in the circle wins a million pounds, like high stakes sort of things. And they kind of document um, adding further pressure to the situation to kind of increase the stakes um, and keep people watching to see, you know, what is the outcome. So that formula he's obviously tested and that's taken quite a significant amount of time he's been doing this for a long time so he's refined that formula he's invested in quite um, a significant production company as well he's set up his own production company to make sure it's really high quality but I think that process of you know he would have started with a few videos tested it refined it each one a little bit getting better and getting better looking at people responding to it comment comments um the the amount of time that it's watched for, which YouTube actually has really good analytics in terms of telling you where the drop-off points are, how many people are, are watching, what's what's going well, and even suggesting um, topics as well. They've got that tool that they've added in as well, like what people are searching for that you could then create content around. So I think that's really helpful in kind of gauging, like, is this working for my audience? What's working? What's not? What can I adapt going forward um, to refine your own style? I do see a lot of people that, like, for example, I had a um, a conversation a few months ago with somebody who wanted just to be this other creator, like Stephen Bartlett, for example, who's a, a very well-known entrepreneur back in the UK. And um, he wanted to do videos just like him and his podcast. And I advise people not to do that because it, it, although imitation is a, is obviously a great compliment to somebody's craft, it isn't your voice and finding your voice. So unfortunately, you do have to go through the messiness of kind of trying a few things seeing what works and then refining it to take what works for you rather than trying just to copy somebody else. Cause that, it, yeah, you, it, there'll be something that won't quite click and you could be creating quite a lot of content for a long time, trying to do a copy of what somebody else is doing, but it just won't work because it, it's not really leaning into what makes you original and authentic. Do you see that at all with the um, YouTube videos that you've been researching as well? Like copy paste with Mr. Beast and stuff like that. Yeah, some of them are, are, are quite similar, aren't they? Um, mm -hmm. Even the thumbnails are similar. They, uh, I, yes. Yeah, there seems to be like the, the yellow text and just angry face or some, <laughs> something provocative or uh, clip clickbaity, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, which is never a great feeling, is it? When you click on something that you think is something and then you watch it and you're just like, oh, no, this wasn't what I expected. That's the ultimate sin, isn't it, in, in YouTube? Because if you click on something and they're they're deceiving you, people don't want to be baited and switched, do they? No, yeah. no, they really don't. So I think it goes back to that point that you raised earlier, like even if it's low quality, but what you're putting out is great content, it's really valuable to your listeners and you're really serving them, then that's the way that's going to really build a strong foundation. And, you know, the rest will take care of itself, but getting those foundations in place is key and not making people feel like you tricked them into watching something that's never a great feeling yeah it isn't and and there will be a drop off won't there as well with uh with yeah. viewers but i i've noticed also and this is uh something that maybe uh you you can answer is uh i i've looked at the you know the metrics the viewer the viewer count on on some of the the, the um the channels and some channels you'll see like they 500 viewers 1000 and then they have one 500,000 don't they Mm -hmm. And I'm I'm sure for them, you mentioned earlier as well is about testing, see what your audience likes. But you know, I'm probably interested in a lot of the videos they put out. But I'm thinking, why is that one five hundred thousand and this one is one thousand? Maybe maybe mm -hmm. you'll have the answer there for me, or give me some ideas as to why that would be the case. Or yeah, I'd look at a few things because it could just be a really good title that's helped to kind of align with what people are searching for. So there's some keywords that really kind of complement that um, the search trends that we're seeing. So it could be just literally that. And it may even be a video that they've gone back and they've made some changes to that title and the show notes, uh, the description below, below the video uh, to kind of really align with what people are searching for. And that's what's propelled it further up the the search results and, and encourage more people to click. So it's not necessarily the content itself. It could be those sort of uh, factors as well. So I'd be looking at that, like, what is it about this? Is it because 
I've used the keywords here. Can I do that with the rest of my videos? Maybe change some of the titles and update them so they are more visible to people, so people are actually seeing my content. Um, is it because I did a promotional strategy for this? Like I posted it on my LinkedIn and told people that this video was out. It, you know, that's also something that people need to think about. It's not just enough just to post something and hope that people are going to find it. You do need to tell people about it. So I think you've got this wonderful audience already that are listening to your podcast. When you're ready to start posting videos, like tell them about it, like tell them about your YouTube channel and what's on there. So they are encouraged to go and discover it. So that that's also another aspect. And yeah, I'd be looking at then the topic. Is there something about this particular topic that's trending? And if so, is there more in which I can explore in this um, that I can get into? So for example, with some of the videos I create for my own kind of creative portfolio, I find the editing ones are always really popular. So that's a good sign to me. I've put out a few now. I'm like, okay, I'll have to do more uh, editing tutorial videos and that's fine. Um, it's definitely not the most exciting thing for me to make videos on because it's a bit like, I don't know. It, it, it's it, yeah it's I, I enjoy editing but then explaining editing while editing a video it's it's a little bit like yeah inception like I feel um but that's <laughs> mm. definitely something that's given me feedback like this is definitely trending people want this they value it so and I've even got comments with people saying hey could you show me how to do a fade in and fade out for music I'm like okay yeah this is what people want yeah that's it isn't it give them what they want and keep yeah. keep giving it keep giving it to them but um you also mentioned the keywords so i i know we, mm. we said about the content but i i noticed that from i was analyzing some some videos and even some popular videos that like their keywords are not all great or you know they're it, when you see the breakdown on tube buddy or one of these one of these tools actually they might have a, a video with 30 40 000 views and uh they just skip the SEO and keywords altogether. Yeah, or they've not updated it because SEO is quite a changeable thing, isn't it? So what may have been a really good key term that people were searching for at that time may have evolved into something else or become really competitive, um, in which case maybe you want to kind of move a bit further down the SEO kind of scale to get something that's a bit easier to rank higher in so it's not kind of like one of these things that we plant and then like there we go it's a tree it'll just grow like you seo does require require some kind of going back to to review no matter what content you create whether it's a blog a vlog or, or even a podcast but it does pay off to do that and it doesn't require too much time if it's part of like your regular let's say you do it quarterly or even at the end of the year you just go back and see like oh this one Perhaps I could uh, do some tweaking to the keywords here to update it to reflect this particular trend. The problem is, I, I, I'm probably wrong here, but I've done my my research on, on videos. Is that once you upload a video to actually edit it to add more content, you have to actually physically take down the video again, don't you? Yeah. You have to re-upload it. Yeah, that's yeah, a exactly. bit of disadvantage, isn't it? I wouldn't suggest doing that. If you feel there's an update to to do for that video, that's a great opportunity for you to maybe, if you really feel it's not serving the audience or it's confusing the audience, you may just uh, put that as unlisted and then uh, release a new one. Or you may just say like, oh, this is part two. And you can even add a, a link to that at the end of that video or a mention of it in the editing tool without making any edits, right? Uh, to say this is an update. Like this, I had this conversation last year. I talked about this. Let's do an update on this. So I do that with microphones for example, because that's always a changing landscape. So there's always something to talk about what's happening with uh, the latest podcasting and video um, microphones that people can use that's on the market based on what's trending at the you know International Broadcasters Convention um, every year. So yeah, you, you'll have content like that, that maybe you do like an annual kind of let's review it. Where are we now? Yeah, the the annual review is is great, and uh, if if you want to get advertisers in, you can also put the the scarcity uh, yeah. in as well. You can say, you know, we're we're closing we're closing the the um the shop on this one. But um, another thing I, I I've looked at as well, and uh, is is they they do penalize you for duplication, don't they? Um, on on YouTube, I'm I'm not sure you're as uh, as I say, I'm only I'm only a beginner here, but um. One thing people talk about is, uh, you know, should I do one long video or a series of shorter videos on each uh, component? Mm -hmm. um, or should I just do the short videos first and then just upload them as one video? What do yeah, you think? Yeah, good question. I think to go back to kind of the creator themselves, I think it really does depend on your style and what's what's sustainable for you. For me, I, I really find long videos, long form videos actually take up a huge amount of time and effort and editing. Um, 
So for me, that's not really a great, a great fix. Obviously I'm running a business. I'm working with different companies to help them with their podcast shows and stuff. So anything I create myself, um, long form is just, and we're talking more than 15 minutes, uh, for, for me that, that that's like long form for me. Um, so, but for me doing a short video, that's like, Hey, I'm going to show you how to, um, set up to record using this particular platform. I'm going to show you this in three steps. It's a five minute video. That's a lot more achievable for me. So I, I can happily commit to short videos that are very bite-sized and focused. And that works for my audience. And that also works for me. It's the difference between me creating and not creating. So I think that's the first question to ask yourself is like, really, what can you sustain? And if you find that, you know, long form is your jam and that's what you love doing, then go for a long form and then do some really nice time stamped um, moments in the description. So you can chapter up that that video for people that are visiting that are just looking for that one specific thing and maybe signal that as well in your video to say like, hey, if you're here for a specific thing, I've got the timestamps below. So if there's a specific question you're looking for, you probably find it there. So you're also not expecting your your uh, viewers to kind of muddle through and try and find the part that they've clicked on your video for if they are just there for kind of a, a reference point. So yeah, those two points I'd, I'd, I'd consider. What's sustainable? What what can you really sustain and what can you lean into? And if you're doing long form, um, then how can you also think about those viewers that may just be there just to come here for that one thing? Depends yeah. on what your YouTube is going to be about anyway, Phil. What's what's your YouTube uh, Well, actually, about? we're launching the uh, EFL Magazine um, a Buyer's Guide. So we're going to be oh, nice. uh, doing a lot of content on tough courses, Celtic courses, et cetera, around the world. And uh, uh, location guides as well and so more to come i'm just uh this is just the trailer here the, f the first one so um yeah so there's there's a lot to talk about for example even uh teaching english in switzerland you know you could you could split it up by you know country guide what's the prices how do you settle in what's the you know what uh, how do you find accommodation what kind of qualifications do you need i mean Am I on the right track here? That's one yeah, kind of that. video. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think when you're thinking about these videos, um, try and prototype one. So try and do a pilot um, and refine that pilot. The pilot will always take the longest time. And it can be a bit frustrating to like do that first episode. So let's say it's a country guide video that you're doing as part of that playlist. And that's a playlist, country guides for teachers. And I love the fact that you're thinking about that kind of human aspect of like, where on earth do you live? Uh, how do you rent a property? Uh, what What's the rules with like, shops here if for switzerland for example everything closes on a sunday i had no idea about that oh, really? when I first moved okay. here. yeah um you know those, those sort of things that if you if you're new here what do you need to know to kind of you know get settled so you can focus on you know building a life here rather than you know running ground after paperwork uh which was kind of my experience when i first moved here um, i think that's a really brilliant idea so think about prototyping that with the first place maybe japan because you're there that would be the easiest one to prototype and then you take that formula that works and then you apply it to the, all the other countries, whether you're asking other people to film it for you, you give them that as the model, the talking points, this is the type of footage I want. And there you go. And you've kind of got a lovely series then uh, for that. So, yeah, Great. That, that's a brilliant idea. Thanks for the encouragement. Yeah, it's... Um... It's something we talked about the formula, isn't it? You you get the yeah. you get the formula done, nail. It's like a PG Woodhouse, isn't it? Every story is basically the same, but it's just hilarious, and he just changes a few details around here and there. So, um, it you don't have to reinvent, do you? you just no. have have your own voice, as you say, and yeah, your own yeah. personality. Um, one thing people talk about as well, uh, talking about personality, is should should the person go on camera or off camera? Mm. Depends on the person, depends on your style. Some people are really not uncomfortable doing piece to camera and that's fine. If it's not your thing, that's absolutely fine. It is lovely for people to see your face. I think it really helps to kind of build that human connection. And if you are concerned about how you appear on camera in terms of like, oh, maybe you, you stumble or you make mistakes or you just don't think you sound that good, that can actually make you, well, it does make you more human and more relatable. And People who you want to resonate with will really appreciate that, like you showing up and they'll go with you on your journey as you improve video on video practice. It's something you can learn. I think we have this um, impression that public speakers are kind of born, but they're really not. They're, it's a skill like any media on camera or on podcast. You, with practice, you will get better and you'll get more comfortable with it. So if that's the thing that's stopping you, um, I think give yourself some grace to be a beginner and to lean into that and that learning journey, not be afraid to show that. I think it'll make you so much more relatable to your audience. Um, if it's a case of like, oh, I'm not sure which is going to be best in terms of what will 
um, create the most views or what's best suited for my audience and my creative style. I think coming back to that pilot again, by just committing to your pilot episode of like really refining that idea and trying a few ideas as you're putting it together, it will take a lot of time to put that first episode together, but it's worth spending that time because you can find what works for you, uh, what you can repeat, what's sustainable, um, and what will ultimately help to align with what you're trying to tell, the story you're trying to tell. So I think, yeah, that, sorry, there's no one size fits all, Phil. I can't sure. be like, yeah, definitely do this. But maybe these tips will help people to kind of be a bit more confident in spending some time on trialing that to find what works for them ultimately. Absolutely. Thank you very much for uh, such valuable advice. So I want to go back to more about what you do. So I introduced you as a podcast and video producer, but uh, you're a lot more than that. Hmm. Well, I guess so. I think running my own business, you have to wear quite a lot of hats, right? It's uh, I bet a lot of listeners will relate to that. Um, so yeah, the producing part is one thing. So I do go into um, institutions and schools and produce content for them. So for example, uh, Hamilton Brooks has a new podcast out called Primary Futures. So I, I worked with a studio, the talent, the executive producer, that's the person who has the money uh, to create the first season. And, you know, my role inc included like uh, prepping the talent, planning the episodes, piloting the first one, scripting that. Um, and also the editorial feedback in terms of working with the tech team of editors in terms of what to keep, what to change, how to build that story to kind of create compelling content. Or well, it was compelling. It's just kind of like polishing it into the format that we decided. So that's one aspect of what I do. And then I do training um, for people who are just starting out, uh, particularly for a lot of small business owners I work with who want to do it themselves and start podcasting, start their first mini series or start their video series. I guide them through the process. So I have programs for that. And I have programs for those that are willing to grow as well or ready to grow, I should say, who've been doing it for a while and want to experiment with either trying something new or scaling uh, what they're doing. So a few different hats, I guess I wear um, in what I'm doing at the moment, but really enjoying it. So if you were to give advice to somebody, let's say, listen to this podcast, maybe a budding entrepreneur, business mm. owner in uh, ELT. We, we mentioned before the podcast, I, I said I wouldn't mention that we mentioned before the, the, the podcast because we, we, we tried to keep it for this. But um, uh, some some people want to produce content for students, won't they? Or some some yeah. people want to build business or get students to their business. So one idea, of course, and you see on not uh, not just podcasts but TikTok is like people giving advice, and uh, some of them not so good, are they? But there's mm -hmm. like misspellings mm -hmm. and uh, uh, and everything. Mm -hmm. but there's a uh, there's a lot of um, you know English teachers out there, and I, I know. And and I don't know how successful they are. I follow a lot on LinkedIn. I won't say follow, but they're in my feed, and you know, you go, you go there, and they uh, they put stuff out there on on LinkedIn. So, um, as a uh, as a school owner looking to get business, looking to to attract yeah. students, what kind of ideas? Because I, I'm saying this because you know, as as is often the case that. Uh, there's only a percentage of people will actually do a podcast, won't they? I mean, if yeah. there's a hundred people, maybe one person will could five people will consider it, maybe one two people will end up doing it, won't they? It's just the the way things are. So, for people looking to start a pod, podcast for a business for school, what kind? Where where should they start? I, I think so. From a school marketing perspective, I think it's a really good like top funnel brand awareness. So it's that kind of. A piece that will help people discover you and build the no like trust factor. So if you think about a podcast, really, you're asking people to spend or inviting, I should say, people to spend maybe 15 minutes with you. That's quite a lot of quality time to spend with uh, both prospective and also existing clients. And it's not placing a demand on your clients to also stop and watch something. Uh, which is quite demanding of people's time in the kind of attention economy that we're working in now as creators. Um, not that that's impossible if you want to do a video series, but if you are doing a video series, you have to kind of think about how you're going to keep people watching, which I think is less of a pressure for podcasts, which people tend to listen to. I mean, I wonder what your listeners are doing now while they're listening. They're probably doing errands or you know, doing chores or commuting or just doing something else. It doesn't ex expect you to stop and have to give its full attention. It can fit it around your life. So I think there's a lot of advantages from that perspective. Um, to kind of go back to that perspective of like, okay, if it's your top funnel stuff, so it's helping build your brand awareness, establishing your credibility, 
Um, one thing not to do as a school owner is just to simply teach. So don't do the stuff that you're doing in the classroom on your podcast. That's part of your product. And that's, if you want to use video and podcast as part of your product and services, great, but that's a different conversation. Don't hand it out for free. Um, because you'll just get people that just expect stuff for free. They won't convert into paying clients. That's, that's the, that's the challenge there. So think about, um, what's the dreams you're selling? What's the, what's the outcomes you're selling as part of your school or your education business or entrepreneurial, um, offerings, um, who's the ideal client you're working with? And then how can you tap into that? Cause that's what people will really hang around for. So maybe you work, um, maybe you offer like business English courses for people at a certain point in their career. So maybe your whole podcast is about talking to people and interviewing people at a similar point in their career and, or even people that are just, just a step beyond and how they got there um, and giving tips. Maybe that's your podcast. So it's important to think quite creatively and not just replicate what's happening in the classroom. Um, again, thinking about what's going to build your brand and really appeal to what your clients are working with you for, like why they come to you, what, what's the dream that you're selling and that you're off helping them build um, is, is a key thing. And it's often something I, I see a lot of people miss because it's comf- comfortable, isn't it? Just to do, um, we see this with TikTok, just teaching videos. Here's a point to teach. Those people, even though they may have huge number of followings, don't necessarily have a business model. So I'd, I'd warn against looking at the, the very nice, attractive kind of following numbers as an indicator of how well they're doing in business. So once you you mentioned it, thank you for that nice segue there about uh, what medium you should use. And, you know, you mentioned TikTok and it's true, isn't it? You can blow up on TikTok. But yeah. It, yeah. It, it doesn't mean anything. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know the for TikTok. Is it something like 16 to 20 or something is kind of the core viewership is i don't know it's very they're very young aren't they i think or tiktok yeah i mean mm. they're growing up as well with it right but it is a younger audience so you have to ask yourself is your audience on this platform where is your audience hanging out what are they doing uh, and where can you go and um a tell them about what you're creating and b kind of create content that they can easily find so for me like i, I with my own podcast that i have with my own portfolio um i target teachers who are very busy who are very much on the periphery of of conversations about development. They really don't have a lot of time. So that's why podcast works out perfectly for them because, you know, when I ask them, I do regular market research every every year. And I ask them, what are you doing when you listen to the podcast? They say, oh, well, it's, I'm commuting. I'm doing something else. Um, I'm on a quick break. And I like the fact that I get a few ideas and I can take and try it out that week. So I think it's, yeah, if your audience is on TikTok and that's where you're going to target them, great. That's where you can create content. But yeah, come back to that question of like, who is your target audience? How are you going to serve them and what's the best format for them? So I know uh, from uh, Leah Sparrow, one of my guests. Hello, Leah, if you're listening, uh, who, who uh, we've t- we've talked uh, a lot throughout the years. Uh, she pointed me in the direction of I, I have it here behind my desk because she she said I was squirreling, you know, going between different things. And she said, have one product marketed to one persona, focus on one traffic source, send that traffic source to one conversion mechanism, focus on this for one year until you month on month overgrowth. So let's say we're going to leave out TikTok. So would we go for, uh, would we go for Instagram? Would we go for YouTube or, or how would we choose that? Which would, you know, what, what kind of market we're looking for. Yeah. Again, I think it it would depend on, um, where your audience is hanging out, how you want to target them. I think hmm, it's, it's, that's, that's a really good question. I really love the simplicity of that model, by the way, that you just shared as well, like keeping things very simple, very clean and, and lean as you evolve and develop and not trying to pack too many offers or too many things in and getting overwhelmed. I think it really helps to kind of gain, build momentum. So that's a brilliant advice. Um, I'd, I'd come back to maybe thinking about the big picture of like the content you can create that really um, answers common questions, concerns, speaks to those dreams, the clients you're wanting to work with, plan that, and then see if you can distribute it in ways uh, to the platforms where they're hanging out. So an example of this may be a podcast, and then you take the clips from the podcast using like Descript, for example, has some amazing clipping tools right now that's really saving a lot of people time. And then maybe you post those clips on um, an Instagram account, or maybe it's on LinkedIn because that's where your audience are kind of in that mindset for what it is you're talking about. Um, so maybe instead of creating lots of little content, which which you can do, um, I th- I'd suggest maybe starting big picture content, slightly longer form, like a, you know, a video of 10 minutes maybe uh, for your YouTube series or, or a podcast. 
and then putting that out there and then clipping it up and redistributing it into clips or audiograms if it's if it's non-video. Um, you can even use the text from the transcript to do some short text and, and uh, visuals and carousel posts. You can use it for your newsletter um, if you have a newsletter or even blogs if you have a website. So maybe that's, a, I find that's a bit more sustainable to kind of go big picture rather than, it's more top down rather than bottom up kind of planning. And that way you're not thinking, I'm just going to create content for this platform, which leaves you at the mercy of those platform changing and trends happening. We're seeing that with Twitter or X at the moment. There's a bit of a migration going to uh, Blue Sky or Blue Ski, however it's said, and, and threads as a result of what we're seeing there. So it's probably best not to lock yourself into one specific platform and creating content for that platform alone, um, because you can be then uh, subject to the whims of, of trends and changes. Yeah, it's true, isn't it? And and just getting back to like the length of videos, it it, it really depends on you know what what, what you want to watch, um, and the 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 content. So for example, uh, if if you're uh, work related, it could be shorter. You can listen to it on the on the way to work, or you listen to it at your desk. But uh, you know maybe we want shorter bite sized pieces, especially for teaching tips. But yeah. if I want to watch a I, I know you've a history background as well. So um you if you wanna if I wanna watch a video on the Punic Wars, I can say, oh, three hours. That's fantastic. I can like spend <laughs> whenever I have time and I can I can come back to it. But uh but you know, I I before I came on here, I I actually Chris Williamson actually he had I don't watch him that often, but he had some guest on about uh five things that will boost your life or something and it was like eight minutes and i was like okay eight minutes is just okay i'll just last eight minutes on that one we we do measure these things don't we 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 um we know how much time to invest and if if it's too long for what we're you know superficially interested in or just one quick bite-sized answers we're not gonna we're not gonna listen to it or watch it are we no, not necessarily. And I think it's it's really good for people that are creating content to think about like how can you repurpose that content into short clips that kind of convey to people in a short amount of time. Why, what's in it for them? And why should they go and watch that eight minute video? Even if that's just um, a section of copy that you put on your LinkedIn post or your Instagram post that says, you know, this is a really interesting question that we explored today. So if you're thinking about this, this and this, this is the episode for you and, you know, comment this for the link and I'll send it to you so you can watch it. So I think it's important to kind of think about how we promote that and how we tell, convey to people what the value is for them. So why they should go again, coming back to that respecting people's time um, and telling people about what we've created for them and not just expecting to put something out there and then, yeah, of course they'll watch it. Well, yeah, maybe they won't because maybe they haven't bought that, built that trust with us yet where they know that, oh, you know, eight minutes spent watching this video. Oh, I watched one last week. That was brilliant. Yeah, I am going to sit down. You haven't built that relationship yet with that potential audience member. So thinking about how you kind of um, tell them and signpost them to to where your content is and what it could bring them is pretty key. Exactly. So um, tell me a little bit about your business. So uh, once once we're here and uh, how, how you're doing and uh, I... Of course, we you don't have to tell us your uh, under the hood or your your secret <laughs> formula or anything. But um, tell me about uh, customers you you deal uh, you're working with at the moment and uh, how you can help uh, new customers, potential customers. Yeah, so it's it's been an exciting year in business. I've just uh, passed my first year in business, which has been it's been a learning curve, which I'm sure a lot of and yourself can. Uh, relate to you learn a lot in that first year right so and um, what you mentioned earlier about that kind of keeping things lean um and really just leaning into that one offer and really refining that has been something i've definitely focused on this past year so um one of the things i um help people with is starting podcasts um so that's a huge thing because there's so many people who haven't started yet and find the tech or just the intimidation of the time that can be spent on creating um, something such as a podcast, quite intimidating. So the podcast Pathfinder has been like my flagship program that I've been refining over this past year. And I work with a lot of teachers, trainers, um, educators, like educators who may be like copywriters in education or like entrepreneurial uh, folk who work in the education realm who want to start podcasting and want that guidance over like, how do you develop an idea? How do you plan that first mini series? How on earth do you script? Uh, your first episodes and how do you align it with your business goals as well? So you're not 
forgetting that part. And so it can work for your business and what you want to achieve. So that's one of the big things I've been working on. It's been a real joy to kind of work with people. For example, a client's brought podcasting to her school, an academy in Spain. Another one's brought it to her language coaching business. And I have um, others that are, you know, transitioning from working for a company to setting up their own company and wanting to use their podcast very much as a, a point to kind of start building their brand and putting themselves out there more and building a portfolio that really belongs to them. So I, I love the fact that it attracts so many different people and how they're utilizing this media uh, to, to, yeah, to take them forward and to serve people as well. It's brilliant. It's exciting times, isn't it? Because I, I, I is. remember watching uh, when I was a kid, there was a TV show, TV program called Press Gang. Do you remember that one? With the, no, I don't remember that oh, one. Was what before was that, that was kind of eighties. It was about like a school newspaper. Was it a school? Yeah. Newspaper? I remember Dexter Fletcher was the main guy in it, and there was somebody else. Maybe um, I can't remember who the girl was in it, but uh, they were like kind of teenagers. That was around the same age, but you know, it was kind of cool. You have a you have like a your own school newspaper now. W- we have our own school newspapers. We have our own TV studios. We have our own radio studios, don't we? And, mm-hmm. you know, it's it's exciting times for, for kids and teenagers and college students. It really is. And, I, you know, I think for those that may not feel that they haven't built that yet, it, it doesn't mean you have to have like a high-end studio to record stuff. You can uh, kind of set up your own studio in, in small spaces where that's a small classroom, um, or even if for those working from home, like um, a space in your office as well, like it, it, studios can look different for different places, depending on the resources and the space you have available, but it's very much more achievable now. And I'm seeing it like companies and individuals setting up a recording booth. I know people who record in like their laundry room because that's a really good space for for acoustics. And nobody knows if you're, if you're only doing audio only, nobody has to know that you're recording in a closet or a, a laundry space, which I think is, uh, I think it's really exciting how creative people are being in kind of setting up these spaces to create content that can potentially go out and reach so many people and enter new markets that they haven't ever visited before. Yeah, exactly. And uh, it's it's like that when, when I started the magazine, all those was almost 10 years now. And uh, mm-hmm. the, when I first was like, oh, my God, there's people in Ecuador, people in, Af- you know, in yeah. uh, Pakistan. And it's just uh, amazing. Yeah, it is, isn't it? But uh, we couldn't have done that before. But um, so thank you very much for, for coming on today, Laura. I, I learned a lot and I hope the... Uh, the listeners uh, learned a lot as well and are inspired to start their own businesses on, on podcasts. Um, if people want to get in contact with you, I'll put the information in, in the show notes anyway. Um, but uh, is there anything uh, you're working on at the moment that uh, you like collaboration or uh, is- you know, yeah, from... there's, a, there's a few things in the pipeline, some really exciting projects that I unfortunately can't talk about yet because I'm just waiting to sign off uh, contracts. But I think what listeners may be most interested in is that I'm creating a video course for those who want to create short form video that may be quite uh, shy in being on camera or not sure about what to what to create for uh, putting themselves out there. So that's something I'm creating because people ask me for it. They've been asking me for it for about six months now. So I'm like, OK. I think I think there's a demand for it. So if you want to learn more about that or the podcasting I do, go to communicatingforimpact.com. Communicatingforimpact.com. Um, and uh, I connected with you on LinkedIn. Are you, you're on Twitter and all the, uh, the other places? I, I do Instagram and I do LinkedIn and that's as much as I can do. I think you have to think about yeah. how much headspace <laughs> we have as I business know. owners. They're the two yeah. spaces that um, I love to hang out. So depending on your preference, uh, folk can follow me on LinkedIn or Instagram. The content's slightly different. Uh, I think Instagram's a little bit more fun and gets to see a lot more behind the scenes, whereas LinkedIn is definitely more for the kind of professional uh, kind of crowd. It's a different vibe, isn't it, on LinkedIn yeah, compared to other platforms? it's a bit stuffy, really, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Self, self-promotional and I'm, su- I'm super stoked and I'm uh, I'm so happy. Oh, I'm thrilled. That's the line yeah. I see every all the time, yeah. Are you yeah. really thrilled? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I think, uh, <laughs> uh, to be honest, I think people gilding the lily a bit on, on LinkedIn, but uh, mm-hmm. that's all, all part of it. I mean, there's, there's I, as you mentioned, there's some people are, are shy, aren't they? And they, they don't do mm-hmm. it enough. And then people are, you know, they're doing it too much, maybe. So there, there has to be, we have to get them in the room together and get them to, you know, give each other advice. Um, so thanks again, Laura. 
for it's coming been on the podcast. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for listening to the EFL Magazine Business Podcast with Philip Pound. For more great advice and resources, check out eflmagazine.com. If you found this podcast helpful, be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. See you next time.